Welcome to the podcast of MotorWeek, television's original automotive magazine. MotorWeek is made possible by Lucas Oil, TireRack.com, and RockAuto.com. Here's your MotorWeek podcast host, John Davis. Thank you, Alec Webb, and welcome everyone to MotorWeek podcast number 271. I am John Davis, and I'm joined by Brian Robinson, Greg Carlos, Jessica Ray, and Kyle Scanlon. We've got a full list of folks because we have a full list of things we want to cover. This is a very special episode. We're going to go down and review our 2022 MotorWeek Driver's Choice Awards, where we pick the best vehicles of all types. And let's go right to the top of that list, best family sedan and actually some other best sedans. And Jessica, I'm going to let you uh, take the lead on this one. Tell us what uh, best cars uh, won this year. Yeah, so for best family sedan, and um, we almost use that term a little bit loosely just because, you know, the the more loosely than ever, <laughs> right? More loosely than ever, just because of um, you know it's the sedan market, just in, in general. What what does that mean? And and just the offerings are much slimmer than they've ever been. So our pick for best family sedan was the all new 2022 Honda Civic, which um, certainly does everything well. And that is exactly why we picked it. It it has a, its purpose being this entry level, um, what one once we were able to call a compact sedan, can we really refer to it as a compact sedan anymore? I guess compared to, um, an accord, but there's still so much room, but a lot of standard safety features. It has some really nice new exterior styling. Um, it's still, if you look at the price compared to the uh, rest of uh, its competition, it's still relatively low. And of course it's a Civic. So you have this, and we haven't tested all of the variants quite yet because we're waiting for them all to come out, but um, you know, you will still have the the option for an SI and a Type R. You'll be able to get a manual transmission in it. We had a hatchback in recently, so it's just a lot to love um, for a, a pretty low price. And it, like I said, it serves its purpose, which is it's a safe, affordable car for a young demographic. I mean, how many people uh, was the Honda Civic their first car? So. Um, that is our, our choice for the best family sedan. I've already had a, a question uh, from a viewer. Why did we drop best? Why did we basically merge compact and family sedan together? And it has mostly to do with the compacts are so roomy now, right? As you touched yeah. on. Yes. I mean, there's so much room that my brother has a, a 2019 Civic and, and it's, it's pretty much all the room that most people need. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's very roomy and um, yeah, no, yeah, absolutely. Anyone have anything else they want to add? Uh, just say good, affordable transportation that looks great and uh, offers luxury car like amenities uh, that you had to buy a luxury car to get not too long ago. Yeah, actually, I just saw the hatchback we have in on our lot and uh it looks great, man. I think it, it's a really nice looking vehicle. At first, like when I first saw it, I thought it was almost like too simple of a design, but now I think it's like just simple enough. Uh, but the wheels specifically on that hatchback we have look like aftermarket wheels, man. They look awesome. Yeah, yeah they it are good looking. Good. I was definitely going to add to what uh, Brian Robinson said when it came to the luxury. When we uh, when we did our, our tester you know, months back, I was uh, very pleasantly surprised when I got into it with how luxurious it did feel for you know an entry level sedan. That, uh, the infotainment system was fantastic. It was extremely comfortable, very roomy. And uh, yeah, once you're inside of it, you definitely feel like you're in a car that you paid more for than you do for a Civic. So nobody bothered by uh, the lack of, uh, of, of knobs on the uh, touchscreen anymore? Uh, we've beat that to death. I think yeah, everybody I think knows where we stand on that. <laughs> yeah, and Honda's bringing the knobs back because it's cool again to have knobs. Yeah, <laughs> it's retro, dog. <laughs> You know, okay, it's funny. Yes. Yeah, well, go ahead. I was going to say one, one more thing before we leave from it is uh, I, I think I saw a, a picture of, uh, of the Integra, the uh, Oh, the new one, yeah. And mm. it is very similar to that Civic interior, so. 
take from that what you will. I think that's a good thing for Acura. Yeah. <laughs> what else you got? All right. So for best luxury sedan, this was a tough choice, I think, because of the price of this vehicle, but it really is just top of the line, top class. Uh, we could not pick another vehicle other than this, but it is the uh, Mercedes-Benz S-Class uh, to comb our award for best luxury sedan. I mean, I, I spent a fair amount of time in it, and it really is one of the most comfortable vehicles to drive. Uh, the, the suspension is phenomenal. I mean, it literally soaks up any, any pothole that you're on, because I drove it in New York. I've talked about this on a previous podcast, but it, it's really incredible. But also the technology on the inside um, is just the augmented reality head-up display is so uh, great for navigation and just Mercedes put so much thought into it. And I'm, I'm really excited for um, seeing the, the tech go down the line of Mercedes and, and sort of uh, find its way into um, the other more achievable, um, models. Um, but yes, no, it's, it's, it's really the standard of luxury. Yeah. I'm not so much worried about the price because we are talking about luxury vehicles. Uh, to me, it's one of those, some of all its parts other than maybe ride quality, which is truly uh, phenomenal. Is it the best that any other one thing? I don't know, but put it all together. And, uh, it's just an amazing driving experience um super solid and even at the base engine that we had uh tons of power as i recall when we had a uh, debate about this i was probably one of its harshest critics and i did that just because i feel like i was trying to play devil's advocate because i had heard nothing but good things like great things from everybody else on the staff so i tried to find things wrong with it uh, which i eventually did but admittedly they were nitpicky things like uh, the 3D uh, gauge screen I found is just completely gratuitous. It, yeah, I absolutely. don't see what it offered, uh, but the, I you could started turn it thinking. Off. I yeah, you can turn it off. You're right. I started thinking about it though, and when we eventually made the vote, um, a luxury sedan of this caliber uh, at this price point should offer features like that. And the S class. Uh, we've already talked about how great it rides, uh, but it's just the technology in this thing is unbelievable. And not only is the technology itself unbelievable, but it's presentation, the full screen that goes from essentially the whole length of the dash. Uh, we've talked about how beautiful it was. It already was beautiful, but now it's even prettier. So it's, I mean, it's, it's hard to say you get all of your money's worth for something that costs, you know, around a hundred grand but you, you get a lot for this. Yeah, you certainly don't feel like you got ripped off spending that kind of money. Uh, one of the features I found really interesting was, uh, you know, with how much I drive the vehicles, uh, after quite some time on the highway, it asked me if I wanted one of the revitalized features. So it uses the, the in-seat massagers <laughs> and yep. puts on special soundtracks and changes all the ambient lighting <laughs> in the vehicle, which... Also, the ambient lighting is absolutely ridiculous. I had so much it's fun gorgeous. every time I drove it around, changing what colors were on there. And you almost feel like you're driving around. It's just like a nightclub on wheels when it's dark <laughs> out. You have those but, lights oh, on. Again, to like the gratuitousness of oh, it's it. It's like, gratuitous. <laughs> uh, like, yeah, it's almost distracting. Honestly, you have to, <laughs> the brightest level I would not recommend for nighttime driving because it is bright. Oh, yeah, I did that. I put everything on the blue lights and then turned it all the way up. And every car I was passing, they're looking down into the Mercedes, wondering what the heck's going on in there. Because it just, again, looked like a gosh darn nightclub. <laughs> you know, a lot of people, we talk often on the show about, you know, the diminished number of cars in general. But fortunately, there still are quite a few performance cars out there. And Brian Robinson, why don't you take us through our performance car categories? Absolutely. Um, perhaps not as many as in years past, but they are still out there. Uh, we'll start it off with Best Sport Sedan, uh, which goes to the Cadillac CTS or CT4 and CT5 V uh, Black Wings. Uh, they are awesome. They are truly world-class sports sedans which Cadillac has flirted with uh, for years now. Uh, I think they finally um, 
succeeded in that, which is ironic since they've already said they're going to be an all EV brand very soon. So I don't know where that leaves the black wings. Uh, the one we had, we had the CT5 uh, V uh, down at Roebling, which was awesome. 668 horsepower, I think. Just amazing amount of torque. Uh, fun to get around the track. Um, CT4 uh, V haven't driven yet, but they're all based on the, you know, Camaro chassis. So it's basically just a amazing uh, Camaro uh, sedan. Yeah, you know, it, the, um, the, when I drove the, 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 uh, the CT5, I don't know what I was expecting, but, you know, if you could not know what you were in, I'm not sure you could tell the difference between it and the best European brands you can think of, except that it sounded better. It had a, a, a great gnarl to it. Just I, a, it was, it was a cool car. So yeah, like Robinson had mentioned, we had it down in Roebling with, I mean, we're talking 911 GT3. It was up uh, with, mm -hmm. it was with uh, Huracan STO, but the, the comment, the overwhelming comment from mostly our videographers, cause they're out there on the track um, was that the Cadillac probably sounded the best. Yeah. And I'd have to agree. I mean, it is a nasty sound and I'm a big uh, sleeper sedan fan. I can't say this is necessarily a sleeper. You can tell it's, it's pretty beefed up from looking at the CT five V uh, but you know, four doors, a manual transmission and a V eight. Uh, it's just, it's awesome. And you would think you'd be able to just oversteer the crap out of this thing around the track and you can do it, but you kind of have to work a little bit more than I expected. It's, it's pretty grippy. Yeah, you know, I dealt with some wheel spin on it a few times, just getting out of the pits and getting going in the track. But there was, I pushed it pretty hard at Roebling there through, uh, you know, turns four and five, and I couldn't get it to get squirrely on me at all. Granted, both Greg and Robinson, you are better drivers than me, so you have a better chance of doing that. But I, I definitely pushed it to, you know, within my, my comfort limits, and I couldn't get the rear end to go anywhere. Manual There's also a V8. million. <laughs> I just want to say manual V8, talk about a, uh, a rare breed go ahead greg uh yeah just i mean not to talk about it too much there's just like a million levels of traction control on mm -hmm. that thing i mean you yeah. can really dial it into just a little bit of traction to like you know as much traction you can as much um help you can get uh you know while still you know keeping within its own your own limits yeah, that's kind of to its detriment, at least for us, because it's we don't have time to sit there and take days to learn all that stuff, right? We got to jump in and get stuff shot and get stuff tested. So I think we, you know, could have had maybe a little more fun with it. We'd have more time to play with it. But certainly if you you can get a 10 speed auto as well, uh, which is a couple tenths quicker, zero to 60, obviously. But uh, just the fact that you can get a manual is pretty uh, phenomenal. Jay Ray, you got any comments? I just thought that interior was really cool. It has like really cool, like carbon fiber, um, like sort of wrapped around like the seats and the backs of the seats. And um, when we would take it out and uh, like go to dinner or something, and I was like sitting in the rear, I just noticed how, like, it sounds really great from the outside, but it also sounds really good from the inside. Like if you were a person buying it and you like had your kids in the mm -hmm. back, it's not going to be incredibly overwhelming, but the sound, it just, it's really just a very well done sports sedan by GM. Really well done. And yeah, they, rush. yeah, they cost like 85 to start. Uh, <laughs> ours was over a hundred thousand. Uh, so we're going to take things in the total opposite direction. Talk about our best sport coupe, uh, which is the combo of the Subaru BRZ and Toyota GR86. Uh, basically one for the same thing that made them so great to begin with, just small, lightweight, nimble, fun to drive packages that um, didn't ex really exist anymore until that car came out and just about anyone uh, can afford it. Uh, they don't sell in big numbers, but anyone that drives one and certainly anyone that owns one uh, loves them. The big change for this year was more tech, obviously better style, more power. Uh, they put a much bigger engine it went from two liter to 2.4 liters uh it didn't get a whole lot more power but it got a lot more mid-range torque uh which as you all know makes uh, all the difference on a track yeah and th these things are mostly going to be used on uh, autocross which if you if you get one uh, highly recommend doing 
Uh, but I think if you get the Toyota, the GR86, you actually get a membership to one of the, you know, you can, they will offer you a way to get it on the track, which is really cool. And you should seriously consider it. What else you got, Brian? All right, moving on. So our uh, best uh, performance car actually goes to a repeat winner, Porsche 718 family. Um, just everything we drove uh, over last year, nothing really can compare to the total package of the 718, whether you're talking the base Boxster or you want to go extreme with the Cayman GT4. Uh, they just do everything right. Uh, and there's not too many cars where you can get in an absolute base model, like a base Boxster and not regret getting the base model. I mean, that car, uh, is just brilliant. And, uh, just all the performance of the, like the Boxster Spider, that four liter flat six, just, they got it all uh, total package and, uh, Porsche is killing it. Yeah, definitely. Go ahead. You go, no, you go, Kyle. You go. Saying, um, you know, last year we drove a fair amount of Porsches, you know, all over from, you know, 911s and Carreras and all that kind of stuff. But I got to say my favorite was the, the 718 Cayman GT4. When we had that car on test, it absolutely blew my mind. It was a blast on the track. It was one of the biggest head turners that I've definitely driven in the past year when it comes to either being in town or being on the highway. You know, I'd be in the, in the middle lane, you know, driving responsibly. And next thing I know, there's some, somebody in a Mustang pulls up <laughs> next to me, revs the engine a few times and takes off. And, you know, unfortunately it's not my personal vehicle because I couldn't go play with them because we have to be safe with our <laughs> test vehicles. But um, I definitely believe I would have beat them. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think uh, I, I've always loved the, the 718. I think what Brian was saying, you know, even the base models is, is great, which uh, when we think of, like affordability, I wouldn't exactly say, um, you know, that is, uh, in the current climate affordability with Porsche allocations. And uh, that's beyond, beyond the point, but, um, certainly I, I, I think it's just, it's really hard to, to beat because they've, they just know exactly how to make it right. And, um, yeah, no, so I, I it's just such a good vehicle, truthfully. You know, I think I, I feel like I cut everybody off about the um, uh, best sport coupe, uh, the 86 and BRZ. Do anybody else have any more comments about the those two? Because of, of all the performance cars we tested, they're easily the most accessible before we I, move on to SUVs. Oh, I mean, I mean, I, I guess I might just say like I had so I took uh, the 86 on the track and that was by far my favorite car, I think, just because it was small and lightweight to throw around and um, you know, for, for it's, it's a lot of bang for your buck. I mean, it's certainly not flashy on the inside, but that's not why people buy those cars. So um, yeah, no, I had, I had an absolute blast in the 86 personally. Final word. Get the manual. Uh, we had yeah. The, we yeah. did get, it was nice to get a chance in the automatic on the track. Uh, but we would have definitely preferred a manual transmission and you can certainly get that in either the 86 or the BRZ and you should. I'll, I, I, we didn't really talk too much about the interior, but to me, we use the word refined a lot, but it was like night and day compared to the first generation car, the first generation car, all my, <coughs> the first generation car was a, a scion and it looked like a scion. This looked like, a real Toyota, much more finished off, much more refined, much smoother, and just a car you could live with easily without uh, making any uh, judgments. Well, as we all know, the market has more and more gone to uh, trucks and SUVs. And so to get us started down that lengthy list of best of for the year, I'm going to turn it over to Greg. Yeah, I guess I should say I'm honored to be given this assignment from Jess here. <laughs> this is the this is the big category, really. The small, mid-size, and full-size SUVs. That's what everybody's buying, right? Right. Yep. <laughs> um, you'll have to excuse me if I pause for a moment. I have all these notes. I don't have uh, Robinson's brain. I can't remember everything, so <laughs> I have all my notes that I'm trying to get through. So we'll start with nobody the... has Brian Robinson's <laughs> brain, but that's okay. Thankfully, I don't even probably. think he has his brain. So. <laughs> 
we'll start with the small uh and small is with volkswagen is relative and uh to give that away it's the volkswagen taos wins uh, the best small uh utility because again as i uh, alluded to they tend to take a category volkswagen does look at what the biggest competitor is and then make their car bigger we saw it with the tiguan uh, it's the only one in that segment to offer three rows. Uh, the Taos is smaller. It's a compact. Uh, but again, it's bigger than like the Seltos. It's bigger than the, um, I guess it's subcompact uh, because it's, they, uh, Volkswagen says they compete against the Crosstrek and Seltos, uh, things like that. Taos is bigger. We like that. There's a lot of room to move around. This is Driver's Choice Awards. So we like the way... It drives as opposed to some of the other ones. I would say the biggest competition, probably the biggest debate we had was between the Mazda CX-30 uh, Turbo and, and the Taos, uh, with the Taos obviously uh, winning because it's more affordable than, than the Mazda. Uh, lots of really nice tech, really nice looking inside. Um, I'd say specifically the driver's choice, if we want to go even further, more specific, uh, would be the Taos 4Motion because not only do you get the all-wheel drive system, you get an updated rear suspension. Uh, the, the base model front wheel drive gets a torsion beam. The all wheel drive gets a multi-link. You also get a DSG, a seven speed, as opposed to an eight speed in the front wheel drive. So if we had to choose a specific model, it would be the Taos 4 motion. Yeah, and that does, the ride quality does make, uh, does stand out in this segment uh, for sure. Um, yeah, the interior, almost Audi-like. Um, yeah, great vehicle altogether. It's, I'm just glad to see that as much emphasis as they're putting on EVs, uh, they haven't put the gas powered vehicles on the back burner just yet. So thank you, Volkswagen. Yeah, I mean, I the the Taos it does entry level very well. You know, there's a lot of standard uh, features there, which um, a lot of young buyers looking in this price point are looking for. They want those. Um, you know, more luxury features and, um, and standard safety features. So it does, it does a lot really well. And I also think it's just a very good looking, um, you know, small, small crossover as well. So, so yeah, no, I think Taos is a, is a good one. Yeah. It's like I recently had a, a friend whose, um, daughter-in-law was in the market for, uh, subcompact and a compact and uh, my friend kept trying to push them towards oh other brands toyota kia whatever and um they kept coming back to the taos for the reason that we all love almost everything volkswagen does is that it drove so well it, you know it truly is a driver's choice it's a german engineered vehicle and it feels like one sometimes you can describe all the aspects of it sometimes it's just subliminal but you know very precise handler and lives up well to the volkswagen heritage yep uh which brings us to midsize and there's stiff competition here this is a uh, major one. major segment um we'll get right to it our winner was the nissan pathfinder um, we happen to have a long term in right now we, our road test was on a, I want to say an SL, uh, but our long-term tester is a platinum, which uh, runs about 51 grand. It's over 50 grand. Uh, but I think what stands out most about this one is it's bang for the buck, which Nissan has been really going after recently. Uh, the Pathfinder is probably the best example of that. It's physically big. The, it looks pretty on the inside, the seats. It looks like there's a lot of attention to detail with the diamond stitching. It's two-toned, um, digital gauges, heated and cooled front seats, heated second row captain's chairs. There is a third row. Uh, the utility of it being able to put in four foot wide building materials straight into the back without going over wheel wells. I mean, it's just, uh, there's just a lot there. And um my final note is that it switched from a CVT to an eight-speed transmission, which makes Great. a huge difference. <clears throat> it doesn't, you know, it still uses the 3.516, just shy of 300 horsepower, but that geared transmission does a lot for it. It feels more powerful. Is, that an eight, is it an eight-speed or a nine-speed? Uh, I believe it. I believe it's a nine-speed. It right? is an. It's a nine-speed. Yes. I can't yeah. read my own handwriting. You're right. It's a nine-speed. <laughs> 
just... once, once you get past seven, who cares? <laughs> true. You know, the, um, the shifts on it, we've had a lot of trouble with a lot of these seven, eight and nine speeds is it shifts quite well. It's very, you can tell it, but it's pretty, um, it seemed to know what gear it wants to be in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So one of the things that I, I'd say I like the most about it is, um, the, the relatively drastic change in exterior styling. Because, you know, the 2018, 19, and 20 models, it just, you know, the Pathfinder, when I grew up with them, you know, kids and guys getting Pathfinders in high school and stuff like that, they looked like they were meant to go off-road. They looked like they were meant to be rugged, beat up a little bit, take them camping. And the previous generation just didn't have that feel about it, to me at least, that, you know, this is something you just want to throw the dogs in the tents and a, fishing, a couple fishing poles in there and go out in the woods for the weekend. It didn't look like it wanted to do that, but this 2022 model for sure has that look to it where it looks like it, it wants to be thrown around beat up tossed in the mud and you know just hose it off and it's ready to go again i feel like the previous one caught the tail end of everybody really wanting a crossover look to their suv mm -hmm. and then by the time it was developed and put into uh production people were then moving on to the current style of like back to the boxy suv so we we lived with the older one longer probably than they uh than the the life of that style uh, but yeah, they definitely righted that shit. Yep. Very competitive segment, uh, the midsize utility. So um, there, there's quite a few really good offerings, but pretty much everything Greg said, it, you know, Pathfinder sort of nails a, a lot of it. And, um, and what, what Kyle said, styling is huge. I think from, from the reaction that um, we've gotten from, from our road tests and um, some of the, uh, uh, long-term updates we've done since we have a, one in for long-term is that um, overall buyers seem much more um, interested in this Pathfinder with its new styling and with the uh, the new transmission. So for once, you know, Nissan's listening to the buyers. Much more rugged looking. Yeah, well, speaking of rugged, that leads us into... Um, Greg, you are nailing the transitions today. Dude, I just want to say I, I'm, just, I'm just feeling it today. I'm channeling my inner John Davis. <laughs> rugged leads us into large utility. And uh, people are familiar with the Jeep Grand Cherokee. Uh, but this is the Jeep Grand Cherokee L was our pick, which means it's the long wheelbase, three rows. It's a big vehicle. And you're already probably seeing a lot of them on the road uh, because yep. it is an SUV. People like SUVs, but people also really love Grand Cherokees. And their one knock was that it wasn't long enough, couldn't get a third row. Now we have a third row. And not only that, but it's they went very upscale with it because they still make a regular Grand Cherokee. Um, but this one is uh, closer to uh, Grand Wagoneer, which we'll eventually get to. Um, but it's where the nissan offers a lot for the money um this one the the grand cherokee has never really been a cheap vehicle mm -hmm. um so it does i think it's probably one of our more pricey picks uh but we really like the way it drives uh jess you had a lot of great comments about its off-road capability which uh, i'd be curious if you have any more thoughts on that one yeah i mean it's it's one of those cars that people are going to buy and they're going to have no idea what it's capable of um just especially if you opt for the, uh, the, the summit reserve models, you're going to get the top of the line four by four system. Um, and it, it, you know, it's a Jeep. And so the engineers engineered it to be a Jeep, no matter how upscale it's going to look on the inside. Um, and no matter how good it's going to look on the outside. And even though that they know most of their demographic is never going to take it off road, they made it so that it very much still could. Can do yeah, more. I wouldn't say most. I know a lot of people that beat up their Grand Cherokees and certainly in snow and uh, bad weather, they take advantage of that. Uh, still get V6 and still get a V8 in it, which is awesome. Um, yeah, yeah. Basically everything you, people have been wanting a three row Jeep for like ever since the commander went away. And, but Jeep now they kind of muddied the waters because now you can get a wagon here too. So it's almost like <laughs> now that they brought this out, there's no reason for it to exist, but I don't know. <laughs> no, there definitely, I, there <gasps> definitely is. Cause there's a huge size difference between the Wagoneer and, uh, and the, the Greek, the Jeep Grand Cherokee L. But I think, think of, uh, 
one of the things that it does really well, the, the L specifically is that, um, you know, if, if you're using the three rows, yeah, you don't have as much cargo space, but that third row is really engineered for an adult human to sit in. And that is what's really important when it comes to like an actual usable third row. As opposed to what other kind of adults? <laughs> I knew it was going there. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that me? Go, couldn't you? <laughs> Uh, yeah, vertically, one, vertically challenged. <laughs> one, one final note, actually, Robinson and I remember having this conversation in the uh, paddock at Roebling. It has a uh, Macintosh sound system you can get uh, at the top level, which when's the last time we saw that in any vehicle? <laughs> Pretty cool. The, yeah, the original V6 or flat six uh, Subaru Outback that that uh, brought the Macintosh into the automotive world and then quickly disappeared. Boy. Talk so about good. memory. Wow. Uh, I just hold <laughs> on that. Event. It's that brain. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, final category I get to talk about is uh, luxury, luxury utility. This goes to the Genesis GV80, their first uh, SUV. Took a while, but they got it to market and they Nailed did it. a really good job. Uh, yeah, it took a long time, but they were obviously doing it or they were obviously taking their time with it uh, to make sure it was right. And they got it right. A couple of powertrain options. You get a 2.5 liter I4's base. Uh, it's 300 horsepower, uh, or you could jump up to a twin turbo V6. A little bit, it's not a way more horsepower. It's up to 375, but it's all about the torque. Uh, for my money, uh, you're gonna want that twin turbo, especially in a luxury uh, SUV. Interior is just really well done. It's pretty Stunning. minimalist. Stunning. Yeah, it's, it's a great, great way to describe it. Uh, but back to what the Pathfinder did, uh, that the, the GV80 does that for the luxury category, and that is bang for the buck. Uh, it is quite a bit cheaper than things, uh, other SUVs it competes with, and actually stands up quite well in terms of quality and uh, appearance. Yeah, that's the interesting thing. Like a lot of people haven't really realized, but you know, as Hyundai has grown and more people have jumped on board that pricing, it's no longer a huge advantage compared to, you know, a lot of the Hondas and Toyotas. Uh, they're almost very similar price these days, but uh, that's not the case with the Genesis. I mean, it's tens of thousands of dollars less than com comparative uh, European luxury vehicles and uh, tons of space in the GV80 as well. Uh, great, great job. It also just, it also looks good. Like, and it, and it, doesn't look like anything else on the road. Like if you see one, you'll, uh, especially like if you're, if it's driving towards you and you see those two distinct Genesis headlights, you know, it, it really does stand out. And I think it catches a lot of people's eye. It definitely catches people's eyes. I mean, again, you know, most of these cars, especially with the pandemic going on, I'm myself and, you know, Steven are two of the people driving them around the most. And that was another one that was definitely a big head turner. There were, uh, a lot of people, you, know, you see double and triple takes because they're not quite sure what it is. You know, I feel like not as many people, you know, know about the GV80 out there. So it's, you know, really just something brand new and completely foreign to them and seeing the reactions of people. And whenever I'm testing cars, I usually like to, you know, bring them around friends' houses or something like that to get other people's viewpoints on them. And some of them, specifically my friends that aren't very big into cars, just to see how they, how they think about it with people like us who don't, you know, know so much information about them or like a lot of our viewers and this is one that when my friends got in it they sat down and they said you know this thing's great and they're like you know worried about it. You know, how much was it i'm like you know top top of the line starts around seventy five thousand dollars, and they were definitely surprised about that when you're looking at things like tahoes and suburbans and how expensive those are getting you know considering they're still in the somewhat of the luxury suv lineup but uh yeah i was definitely definitely impressed with this vehicle you know, a lot of people don't realize you get that they don't have their own standalone dealerships. They basically you go to a Hyundai store to uh, buy one, and I wonder how much yeah. longer that's going to go on. Oh, that's yeah. not the that's not the case everywhere. There are standalone uh, Genesis dealers. I think they're definitely are transitioning into yeah. that, getting them out of the Hyundai's. Right now, around here, the uh, they seem to be in there. I I know I was went looking online for. 80s and 70s just trying to see if they're in stock and there are very few of them to be found so somebody's getting the word out that it's a hot property so well 
Kyle, we're going to turn <laughs> yes. to you for uh, the truck winners. And for the first time in our driver's choice, we actually have three. So take it away. All right. So first of all, we're going to start with the best compact, which was the Ford Maverick. And um, this car was was very impressive. It's the, the first pickup in America with a standard full hybrid powertrain. Uh, projected fuel economy is EPA estimated 400 or 440 MPGs with a 500 mile range on a single fill up. And uh, this is with a truck, you know, obviously it's a compact truck, but the payload is 1500 pounds, which is enough volume to carry like a standard ATV, 2000 pounds of towing. And uh, that's with the 2.5 liter Atkin Atkinson cycle four cylinder, which has 191 horsepower and 155 pound feet of torque which you can then upgrade to the two liter EcoBoost that has 250 horsepower and 277 pound feet of torque with an optional 4,000 pound tow package. So for such a small vehicle, you know, you can tow an 18, 21 foot boat with a trailer, you know, for the 4,000 pound tow package. And uh, to add to it, the, the interior is one of the things that surprised me the most because I got into it and I'm not, I'm an average height person. I'm only five, nine, but I had a ton of headroom in that car, even when we were at the track testing it and I had my helmet on. And it's, uh, it's just one of the things that kind of swayed me the most to be kind of in love with such a small truck. Cause I'm a truck owner. I'm a, I, I love full size trucks. I'm in love with super duties. I never thought I would like a compact truck as much as I enjoyed driving this one. Yeah, there hasn't really been any compacts in a while. We've been shouting about it for years. Uh, yeah. So when they finally bring one out, it's hard not to give it an award. There was also another entry. We should know the San Hyundai Santa Cruz. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the reason the Maverick, uh, it's just way more truck-like uh, compared to the Santa Cruz. I think that's maybe um, what got it the award. Uh, it's also priced less. It's not only the most efficient truck you can buy, it's the cheapest Ford you can even buy. Mm -hmm. So that says a lot to uh, where trucks are these days and what uh, Ford can do with them. It really becomes a, a new entry level vehicle for Ford. And, you know, if you're looking for that either for yourself or for uh, one of your children, um, who knew you could buy a truck that got that kind of fuel economy uh, and had that kind of price point. Here it is. Yeah, it's, and I think... Or I just want to say it, it's also made, made, um, you know, I think people who aren't interested in trucks interested in buying a Ford Maverick. It's, it's one of those things that, um, I think auto journalists probably are more aware of than the gen pop. Uh, but you know, the, the idea of a small pickup truck, the utility of it, I mean, I think it's very appealing. Um, and now they have a hybrid in it. It's just, it's a very intriguing option. And if it keeps people from overbuying pickup trucks, that's a, that's a good thing. Cause I know so many people who buy a pickup and they get upsold on an F-150 when they would be fine with a Ranger or a Silverado when they'd be cool with a, uh, a Colorado. Um, it's, I, I think it's a sweet spot. I hope so. It's been a long time coming back. What's next, Kyle? Next, we have the winner for the midsize truck, which was the Nissan Frontier. And uh, this, just like when we were just talking about the Pathfinder, Nissan has gone back to more of a boxy, rugged look. Uh, the difference in exterior styling between the 21 and 22 is just off the charts. The, the 22, I would almost just say it looks like it, it's meaner. And, you know, it's got an aggressive front and it's got the skid plates with the pro package. Uh, great looking fenders, enough space in the trunk, or not the trunk, sorry, enough space in the bed uh, to, you know, do your trips to Home Depot and not have to worry about it fitting in there, which is one of the things why I voted for this over, uh, oh, never mind, wrong truck, not the, not the compact model. Um, but yeah, the, the exterior styling was fantastic. It has the 3.8 liter V6 with 310 horsepower and 281 pound feet of torque. I drove this both off-roading and on the track and can say, it's uh, it definitely surprised me. It wasn't quite as fast as the the Maverick, but obviously being in uh, in different categories, we don't have to put them next to each other. The towing capacity sixty seven hundred and twenty pounds, um, and that's that's a good amount of towing capacity for a mid sized truck. It can definitely get you some of your toys into the woods or into the water if you want to. And uh, I just say 
it was a little, you know, definitely has a truck like feel when you're driving it. It was a little stiff. It was a little rigid at slower speeds. The steering is a lot heavier than expected for a smaller truck, but overall, you know, it got the award and for good reason. Robinson look deep into your big oh, brain no. there. And <laughs> what was life like when the previous generation path or uh, previous uh, frontier came out? Like, I don't know, a hundred years ago. Yeah. Long time what, ago. And what was your hairstyle back then? <laughs> yeah. The ponytail? Yeah, my I don't man. think we're going quite that far back. Uh, Dude, but... I, I, Go ahead. I just watched a retro or an old episode of you and the excursion. And we did a shot of you backing up into a parking space and you were looking into the rear view mirror. It was just gold, man. You just, you, you sold it. Like you were actually backing that truck up with, with purpose. Wow. Right on. <laughs> I do everything with purpose, but uh, the reason, the big reason it just went from the oldest, like Greg mentioned, like when the current path uh, frontier came out, um, it was kind of blocky and truck like old school when it came out. And then it's been around for almost 20 years. So it went from like the most outdated uh, truck to the most modern, comfortable, roomy uh, truck in the class. So uh, absolutely worth an award. I'm, I mentioned earlier that with the Pathfinder that Nissan was listening to their customers. And I think they did exactly that with the Frontier because a lot of the, the people who were buying new Frontiers in like the last few years bought them because they were simple. They liked that. They liked that, that, um, there was a key that you could use to start the car, you know, it didn't have remote start. So, um, uh, so Nissan took that and they, they decided to upgrade what needed to be upgraded, modern, uh, modernized pretty much the interior. You finally, you've got Apple CarPlay and, and, um, everything inside looks really, really great. Um, but it's still very, just enough analog for I, uh, the, the, the people who chose Frontier for the reason uh, for, for these last few, for the last few years, for them to enjoy still driving the truck. And, and like I was said, it, it, it drives like a truck. That's a truck. They kept the character of it intact. Exactly. Pretty much so. Yeah. Uh, thanks for summing it up. <laughs> <laughs> Kyle, one yes. more to go. One more to go is our large pickup segment. And this award went to Ford's entire F-Series. So 150s and the Super Duties, 250, 350, and 450s as well, which I don't know. I've never driven a 450. I don't know if any of you have. Don't forget uh, the Lightning. Yeah. Oh, yes, and the Lightning as well. Um, so to start just with the, with the F-Series, uh, new box steel frame. There's 11 grill options, new 12 inch touchscreen, which comes standard on XLT trims and higher. I should add that the Super Duty uh, gets the new 12 inch touchscreen as well, uh, just with less updates than the F 150s got. Um, some of the fun stuff that goes on in that car the optional interior work surface, which I really enjoy, you can get with either. The, uh, the bench seat or the two individual seats in the front. It has a console shift, which stows away for when you want to use the work surface. Uh, you can use it uh, with you know, your laptop. If you're uh, you know, somebody out on the job site, you can use it to eat your meals on very comfortably, which I have uh, an older F-150 that does not have that kind of feature. And uh, being in the new one, it was definitely nice to use at times when- What did I you eat on there, Kyle? Uh, I ate some tacos. I ate huh? some tacos, and it was really good. It had a lot of space for me to get the the excess taco fallings back into uh, the styrofoam container. <laughs> but, you know, uh, it's really it's really about though the fact that when it comes to trucks, when you think when you look at the F series, they just seem to be ahead of the curve overall. They haven't yeah. abandoned any one piece of their business to do things like the lightning. They keep making improvements all the way around. And of course, you know, first with an aluminum body, all that stuff. And first with turbocharged, you know, V6 engines. Uh, they just, they, they are number one vehicle in this country for decade after decade. And for good reason is they just keep pushing the curve. Yeah, we're, we almost jumped over the plug-in hybrid and the fact yeah. that they have generators in the bed, so. Like you said, absolutely pushing, pushing the yeah. envelope. Yeah, yeah that's, that's good. That's something that, nobody nobody else is doing. No, uh, anything quite like that. So that's huge. 
Yeah, it was the winter last year, and nobody did anything to match it. And then Ford uh, laid down the lightning to uh, just get it further out of everyone's reach. So definitely, that's why it's one. That's got to be the na- the title of our road test when we eventually test the lightning. Laying down the lightning. Laying down the lightning. <laughs> All right. Write that I'll down, it, Robinson. I can see the graphics now. <laughs> I'll put it in right now. <laughs> well, we've talked a lot about first, and um, the next category is the first time that we have taken EVs, electric vehicles, and made it its own category. We've had Best Eco Friendly for quite a few years, but with all the new EVs coming on the market, uh, it was time to carve out a specific uh, battery electric primarily category. And because we um, see so many different ones coming out, we actually have given out three awards covering a wide range of prices and um, capabilities. Uh, I'm going to start with the Megabuck Lucid Air, new startup uh, car company. Uh, The Air sedan kind of burst on the scene with some mind-blowing statistics. Uh, The top model, uh, 1,111 horsepower, 0 to 60, 2.4 seconds, um, range of close to 500 miles. And then you can bump that up to their range model uh, with a 520-mile range, which beats all comers by quite a bit. And uh, still fairly staggering, 933 horsepower. But I think beyond that is people are saying, well, what is the drive like? Well, I've had more experience in it than anyone else. And I was shocked that how much of that European precision flavor sports sedan they've managed to put into it. And a lot of that has to do with some of the personnel that they uh, hired away from people like BMW to help design it. Uh, I don't know what the future of Lucid is. They have an SUV coming as well. But coming out of the box and kind of knocking everybody's socks off, not only with statistics, but with an interior and a driving experience that really is right up there with the best, we didn't feel like we could do a best EVs uh, category without paying some homage to all of their effort. I was going to say, John, you should probably also mention that the really one of the most incredible things about the Lucid is that their top model gets over 500 miles of, of range. And that's, uh, uh, which I thought range. I did, but maybe my did microphone you? dropped out. Yeah, he said 520 is their their high oh, my range bad. But model. The, and the low one still even gets over 400, which is really impressive. Their, yeah, their base model. I, I do agree, though. I feel like that's worth mentioning again is the big cry for EVs is, well, it doesn't have enough range. Well, not Here many cars on a gas engine can go 500 miles. So it's a pretty big deal. It is a huge deal because um, I'm driving around in a large SUV that's got reasonable fuel economy and it's what you want for a long trips. And no matter what I do, when I fill it up, you know, I'm in the 450 to 480 range, even at highway cruising, this thing basically solves that dilemma. And we all know what happens at the top of the market usually trickles down below pretty quickly. Yeah. Anybody else on the Lucid? Interesting vehicle. And they're selling them mostly at um, stores that they've set up in upscale shopping malls. They, uh, everybody always wants to know about service. They plan to open service centers. It's early in the brand's life, but they've gotten off to a, a pretty impressive start. Which also goes for the next vehicle, uh, which is the Rivian uh, R1T, a uh, Rivian mid-size pickup truck. Think, uh, 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 think Honda, think uh, Ranger, that uh, area of uh, pickup truck. Rivian, also a new startup company uh, out of California. The uh, R1T can tow up to 11,000 pounds. Uh, has a range of up to uh, about 314 uh, miles. Uh, I spent quite a bit of time in them uh, on two different occasions, once when they were only had prototypes and once with a a production vehicle last fall. I was very impressed again with drivability, but also with the uh, fit and finish on the interior. 
but also with some of the 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 cool things they did like it's a, a crew cab style truck and it's not the longest bed in the world but they've made storage a priority under the bed uh, there's a cool pass-through tunnel between the cabin and the bed where basically you could carry almost all the camping gear you would need. The bed itself can be secured. They really looked at on and off-road use and said, we want this to be a no compromise truck. It also has a motor at each wheel, which makes it very unusual in the all wheel drive area. Uh, it's the kind of uh, electric technology we've also been said, but it's been coming for a long time and it's here. So I think really Rivian's done a pretty darn good job in there and they have a, an SUV as well coming and that should be pretty much the same vehicle but with a covered back and you can actually get one under like unlike most EV yeah. trucks we've been hearing about for years now yeah I mean they beat the lightning to market you can actually they've they started deliveries a couple months ago anyone else no I mean I, I it's it's a really attractive looking uh truck it's also the first EV of that size you can buy. I mean, everything else is, is smaller. Not only is it the, the first EV pickup, but it really is like the first EV of a considerable size that you can buy. I was in LA for the auto show, uh, probably maybe around the time they started calling it auto mobility, but uh, I was at the show where that was their big coming out party and it absolutely stole the attention. I can't remember anything else that was there that year, but I remember the Rivians and it's very cool to see, you know, everybody had their doubts about whether or not we'd see it, uh, but it's here, it's for sale, you can get one. It's, it's pretty cool. Kind of curious, right. the people that designed this compared notes with uh, the people at Ford designing the Maverick, because when you put them next to each, two photos right next to each other, they're very similar in body style, which I like that Rivian, you know, didn't, didn't go so far into futuristic, you know, electric vehicle styling choice they obviously took some cues to make it look a little more futuristic but they didn't go you know over the top and make it not look like a truck because it just you can still tell it's a truck and it looks like a truck that wants to do truck like things which i agree indeed ford and rivian are closely linked and a lot of ford's profits right now are actually coming from licenses that rivian is uh, uh has that uh, ford's using that go ahead brian you want to say something that leaves us one other EV to talk about. And, you know, we've been seeing small electric uh, crossovers and SUVs coming for quite a while. The, uh, the Mach-E uh, did well in our driver's choice last year. Uh, but this year, Volkswagen ID4, best EV among the trio, uh, the smallest, uh, most affordable of this group. And we were mentioning other earlier about the uh, Volkswagen Taos. Uh, you know, here's the ID4, all electric, still has that character of a Volkswagen when you get behind the wheel. Uh, reasonable price, uh, a good range, 260 miles uh, in uh, one configuration with the all wheel drive. And uh, I think Volkswagen has made good on their promise to not just take the brand towards being all EV, but to do it while keeping their heritage intact. And when we look back at some of the earlier small SUV attempts, uh, like the Bolt, which didn't have all wheel drive, I think we've made real progress here. Yeah, it's probably not the greatest reasoning, but for me, it's the first EV that I've driven that didn't feel like an EV. It just felt like getting in a regular SUV and uh, driving it around. To me, that was pretty impressive. Yeah, I mean, I really... Uh, I had the opportunity, I think it was the first one of us to drive it. I drove like a prototype model. Um, like, I don't remember when over a year quite a while ago. ago. Yeah. Quite a while ago. And, um, it, it really impressed me all around. Just like Brian said, it, it, it doesn't feel like an EV when you're driving it. It's a really good size. I think it's kind of nice looking on the exterior. I love that light bar that it has. Like, if you see one of those things coming, like it, it looks really, really cool. Um, I've seen, I've seen like two around already. Um, and they just, they look really good, really functional. Uh, it doesn't have a frunk, which is sad, but who really needs a frunk because it has plenty of, uh, space in the, in the cargo area. I so, do. I need a frunk. That's my big <laughs> knock on it. What do you put? What do you put there? Oh, I you love put the frunk. shrimp, you oh, know, my God. like well, in the makes, makes What can't you so put in there? Yeah. <laughs> Use your imagination. <laughs> 
Yeah, actually, that was one of the things. The Rivian's got a small front, but nothing like the uh, the Lightning. But anyway, they've done a, a, a fabulous vehicle with it, and I think it makes everybody just sort of sit there and wonder, uh, you know, what the next VW uh, EV is going to be like. Because uh, ID more Buzz, coming. right? Yeah, ID uh, Buzz, the van is coming. We've already seen back. it. Yeah. And no frunk there either, but it also doesn't make any sense because uh, <laughs> it's very flat in the front and you got to put windshield wi wiper fluid somewhere. They got to be careful. You know, it's getting to the point. They don't get that out soon. A lot of us that remember the original uh, old uh, micro buses, uh, we may be beyond our uh, car buying years by then. Anyway, let's see. That leaves one more. And that is our best of the year. And I suppose we could a little drum roll there mm -hmm. uh, those that have gone to motorweek.org already know uh, we gave our best of the year to the ford maverick and i have to say it's for all of the reasons that we talked about when we gave it a uh, best compact truck uh, it's highly affordable it's highly efficient it's highly practical it, and it, and i think really the affordability and the and the economics of operating the, the base hybrid model. It's been a long, long time since we gave our top award to something that almost anybody in the new vehicle market could buy. And, uh, uh, you know, this was uh, a staff pick. And I think it just shows that when you, in this world of where almost half the vehicles we test have six figures to be able to actually pick something where for what even with destination you're talking about 2200 bucks or less uh and it's no wonder that ford is actually all not taking any more orders for the current model year it's done so well and there again the truck king uh, came back to the market at the right time and gave buyers in that market a lot more for a lot less than they expected yeah. No, I mean, it, it, there's, there's so much interest in it. And I, um, I'm just sort of interested to see if they sort of decide to maybe when, when they can get production uh, a little bit more under control to even expand the Maverick lineup a little bit. I'm sure include, they will. Um, cause I know so many people who are like, Oh, we, you know, we want, we want a standard cab or we want a King cab. Um, mm -hmm. so is, that in the future i don't know but i think there's so there's there's a lot there there's so much there i've got a um an extended cab ranger the old ranger and um i'm seriously looking at the maverick but right now the short box is the one thing that would hold me back so if they did a, uh, an extended cab and gave me you know close to a six foot box i think that would be an enormous thing and who knows and they're also uh, according to ford even looking about uh, taking the all-wheel drive an all-wheel drive system and putting it on the on the uh, hybrid powertrain which they haven't done yet i hope they do that as well that'll be huge yeah well thank you all very much for all of your comments that was a terrific rundown of all of our 2022 motor Week driver's choice awards and once again if you want more details and want to actually see the award ceremony it's on the front page of our motorweek.org website. Uh, we've got a couple more things we want to hop on to pretty quickly before we wrap up this podcast. Uh, we're going to do a quick lightning round where everybody gets uh, half a minute or so to make some comments. General Motors recently announced the end of production of the affordable Chevrolet Spark with no replacement in Wait, sight up, to match its sub $15,000 price tag. I lost, you lost me? Yeah. Can you start from the top? Yeah. So we've got a couple other things we want to get to before we wrap up this podcast. And let's do our lightning round where everybody gets a, about 30 seconds or less to talk about a trending automotive topic. And here we go. General Motors announced the end of production of their affordable Chevrolet Spark with no replacement in sight to match its subcompact sub $15,000 price tag that makes the $22,500 Trax Chevy's entry level offering. Does this mark the end of the cheap car? Well, I don't know. After we just talked about the Maverick, what do you guys think? 
I mean, it depends. Are you saying that the cheap car it has to be sub fifteen thousand for it to be a cheap car, or are we going to say sub eighteen something around there to label it? Because there are plenty of sub eighteen thousand dollar cars out there: Nissan Versa, Mitsubishi Mirage, Kia Rio. Uh, you know, all the, all those vehicles are sub eighteen, which I would still consider uh, an affordable, you know, cheap car. But maybe it's just the end of the American cheap car. I, I, I think it just reflects a change in what buyers want. Um, like you said, Kyle, there are cheap cars out there still. So I don't think it's the end to answer the question. Uh, but people want things that are, have a little bit more technology in them now. Those things cost money. And now that a lot of people are financing six, seven years and beyond, uh, I just don't think it's, you know, I think people are willing to pay a little bit more money over that time. Yeah, cheap is relative. Uh, but everything is getting more expensive. And uh, like Greg said, people insist on convenience features and safety features. Uh, those things uh, cost money. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think um, I, I take a look at, like, for example, the Civic, you know, new generation comes around uh, and no longer can you buy a Civic for under uh, $20,000. So it, it's inevitable. I think as prices are rising everywhere that, uh, you know, um, I think $20,000 is a threshold for a lot of people. And uh, as long as there are, are new models out there that you can buy for under that, um, it's not the end of the cheap car, but, but maybe the end of, of, you know, we've seen, uh, the, the fit go out of, uh, production as well. You know, that, that really small subcompact vehicle, um, which a lot of people are interested in. Um, but, it might be it might be the end of times for them in this country i mean after all yes, those are glo those are global vehicles and if they decide there's a market they could bring them back good point and who knows if the uh, you know if we keep hearing about chinese manufacturers and manufacturers from india and of course we've got um, new manufacturers from other parts of asia including um, vietnam uh, maybe one of those will tap in uh, to that segment Speaking of inexpensive vehicles and, uh, and mentioning price, you know, uh, Ford Maverick has already gone up in price, but they managed to keep the, uh, the stripper down at under 20. But how much longer is that going to happen? And we've got a question from uh, Graham Jefferson that came in over YouTube about the Maverick. He says, I've never considered a truck in my life, but the Mag Maverick is an incredible value and is quite efficient. I'm very impressed. Pricing feels right. Looks nice. Not sorely lacking in power. Is this technically or otherwise the cheapest hybrid you can buy? Yes, it yeah, yes. actually is the cheapest hybrid that you can buy. The next cheapest, I believe, is the uh, is the Ionic, and that'll cost you somewhere over twenty four thousand dollars. I think the Insight undercuts it, at least by the list I'm looking at. Insights twenty five two. What I'm looking at. The, I, All the prices have changed so much too, though. Everybody's like. That you. I think you're probably right. I mean, actually, this this might be. I thought it was. Uh, I have a, a tough time keeping track of what year and day it is. So this was actually <laughs> an older article than I thought. Uh, but no, yeah, it even still around twenty three, twenty four is uh, the next cheapest. Yeah, and you could. Oh, Go ahead. So you can you can still buy. There's still plenty of offerings of hybrids under thirty thousand dollars. Oh yeah. But that's still a that's still a ten thousand dollar range, or or more like you know where the Maverick starts and where say like a Camry hybrid is. It's it's about like seven thousand dollars in between, and there's a bunch. There's quite a few models in between there. So there are affordable offerings, but the Maverick. Maverick does it best. And I think you can even, even opt for the, um, the upgrade to the XLT in the Maverick, and it's still the cheapest hybrid out there. So again, we've been talking about entry level, uh, and I think that was a Ford goal that they've, they've met. Yeah, I, you know, I think too, John, uh, and one thing, I, don't, I can't remember if we mentioned it when we mentioned the Maverick, but just the, the pricing, a lot of times, uh, like if you take, for example, uh, like the Hyundai Santa Cruz, the base model between the base model and the top of the line model, it's all, it could be like a 15,000 oh, yeah. uh, to like $18,000 difference. It's, 
I mean, you can, you can get a Maverick for over $30,000, but it's not quite as, um, exaggerated as some other models. Now I hope Ford keeps it that way. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks everybody. And uh, let's move on to our last segment and uh, we'll wrap up with any rants or raves since our last podcast. Anybody have anything? I'll save a full or I'll save everybody from a full on rant. Uh, but I've, I've noticed this actually since the, um, the Mazda CX-5, right when I started at Motor Week back in 2012, using an aluminum hood. And now the more car makers are using aluminum hoods for weight savings. Yeah, uh, it's a little disconcerting when you are driving on the highway and you start seeing them uh, kind of pop up and down a little bit. Uh, it's not just one automaker. I've noticed it with a lot of aluminum hoods. I'm uh, wondering if anybody else has noticed that because <laughs> it uh, it can get a little scary uh, when you, especially when you're driving into the wind and it's like, I know it's latched and it's definitely down, but there's still a little bit of bobble there. I I don't think I've noticed that, but, um, that's an issue I've always had on my Jeep. If, if a truck rolls by because of the way that the Jeep hood latches, it always sort of jiggles a little bit, even though it's pretty heavy. That's mm -hmm. shocking. A Wrangler is a little bit crude and has some movement. <laughs> yeah. Man. <laughs> don't be afraid. <laughs> that, that's my head. Don't be afraid. It's latched. <laughs> You know, I wonder if all that vibration is not going to lead to uh, other problems like paint, uh, you know, paint uh, not holding up as well. I mean, it, <laughs> automakers don't have a good uh, track record of making uh, paint uniform across the vehicle where they've used different materials for different body panels. Well, you'd, you'd like to think they do those like vibration tests yeah, yeah. on all the cars where they literally just like shake the car up and down sort of. Yeah. mimicking probably and they i'm sure they've seen like what greg sees when when uh, a hood pops up so you'd like to think that they're quality testing it so much so that the amount of times in which say like that happens to you when you're driving would never it would they would catch it you know what i mean like sure. or fingers crossed <laughs> well I, there's a there's a difference between you know what i'm talking about and like for instance, I'm recalling when we had the yellow Challenger Hellcat wide body at Roebling, we had a great hood shot uh, going down the straight where you actually see it lift up maybe an eighth of an inch. Uh, but I will note that that was probably 150 plus miles per hour. And it does not do that. Uh, I'm pretty sure. I don't know what if it's an <laughs> aluminum or steel hood. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you won't if you're driving at highway speeds, that will not happen to you on that particular car. <laughs> Thank you all. Thanks, Greg, for that very original rant. And uh, I think we want to thank everybody on the screen or actually, I'm just going to start again. Thanks, everybody, Greg. Thanks for that very original uh, rant. And we're going to bring this very special podcast to a close. But with one note, uh, we will be doing our normal annual full episode about the Motor Week Driver's Choice Awards. It's episode 4123, and it begins airing uh, this weekend. And if you want to check your, the, that'll be on the 12th and 13th. And after that, on public TV stations around the country. And about a week or so after that, on our cable partner, Mav TV. If you're interested in finding, when you can watch uh, Motor Week, go to our motorweek.org website, pull down about the station on the upper right corner and put in your zip code and you can see your local station and the air times. And you can go to mavtv.com to look up their schedule. Uh, soon after that, all of the segments will be up on our youtube.com slash motorweek website. You can also watch Motor Week at PBS Living and also at pbs.org slash Motor Week. If you've got a screen, you can watch Motor Week. Thanks to our two-wheeling reporter, Brian Robinson, for bringing his brain along today. It was highly useful. Our over-the-edge reporter, Greg Carlos. Digital producer, Jessica Ray, who is also the producer of our podcast. And our road test producer, Kyle Scanlon, who's out in the trenches with the vehicles every day. Thanks back at home base to Chief Engineer Jim Bigwood and our podcast creator, Bob Mixter. To you out there, thanks very much for being a fan of Motor Week. We couldn't do it without you. Uh, join us next time for more podcasts. And wherever you go, take Motor Week with you. 
You've been listening to the podcast of Motor Week, television's original automotive magazine. Motor Week is made possible by Lucas Oil, TireRack.com, and RockAuto.com. For additional information on podcasts, videos, and showtimes, visit our website at MotorWeek.org. And watch Motor Week, television's longest-running automotive magazine series, each week on your local PBS station.